Here's a quote from Mr. Vince Gallo on his parents. Quote, my parents took an interest in nothing. At home, no books, no records, nothing. My mother and my father are the emblem of indifference, dryness, and bad taste. My father is also terribly stingy in life as well as in feelings. I have never seen him fill the bathtub. To save, he used to put the water four inches from the bottom. At home, everything was ugly, casual, lacking in love, from the furniture to the clothes, and also behavior. End of quote. Vincent Gallo is probably one of the most interesting, thought-provoking, provocative, and sort of wonderful people and artists I ever researched. I saw Buffalo 66 when it came out back in 1998 and fell in love with it right away. He's very much like another artist I adore, and that's John Cassavetes. Vince Gallo doesn't like being compared to Mr. Cassavetes, and that's fine. Not everybody's a fan of John, but I'm a fan of Vince as well as John, and I find them very similar. I've wanted to talk about this movie for a very long time. I wanted to bring up Mr. Vince Gallo for a very long time because I'm not saying I identify with Vince, but I respect the way he just sort of says what he wants. Um, It's brave to be that way. I admire that. Although I don't agree with everything Vince believes in. I respect his balls. <laughs> is, that, is that right? Is that wrong to have respect like that? As an artist, I respect him. And I love this movie. Buffalo 66. Done in 1998 by Vincent Gallo. He wrote it. He directed it. And of course he stars in it. And it's independent. He did it his way. He put everything. His whole artistic soul. And heart. Into this flick. He did another one as well. Called the Brown Bunny. And it's okay. Very controversial. But this one. Buffalo 66. Was amazing. Let's talk about the picture. Tidbits about the picture. And a little bit more. About Vince himself. In the actors room. Welcome back. Episode 130, and here we go. Vincent Gallo grew up in Buffalo, New York. And if you paid attention to the quote I gave in the first part of this podcast, you got a taste of how he feels about his parents. And uh, I would venture to say or make a good guess that he isn't very fond of his childhood. And Buffalo 66 touches on that. He wanted to bring it to film about his rendition of his childhood and how it affects him still to this day or back in 1998 when he made the picture. And I think a lot of tidbits were thrown into this movie artistically to explain that. For instance, Gallo was not born in 66. He was born in, let me see here. When, when was he born? I have it written down right here. Okay, Vincent Gallo was born in 61. So why is he called Buffalo 66? If you watch the film, you'll see that Angelica Houston plays Vince Gallo's character's mom. 
Uh, Vincent Gallo's character's name is Billy Brown. Billy, Buffalo Bills. And the mother explains in the film that she was giving birth to Billy in 1966 in the movie. And that was the last year the Bills won a championship. And giving birth to Billy, she missed the game. Therefore, missing to see the Buffalo Bills win the championship. So, cleverly, Vincent put in 66 as in the title. Not the year he was born, but the year the Buffalo Bills won the title. Goes to show that the Buffalo Bills were a big part of his childhood because I think his mom was a big fan. And sort of revealing to us that he felt so unwanted at home that he would put that in there. That the mom says in the movie, God, I wish I never even had him. These are strong words. And it, although that's probably probably not true to, to Mrs. Gallo. I don't think Mrs. Gallo would ever say that. But that's how strongly Vincent Gallo despised his childhood. I think it's plain. And putting it in a movie like that, that's harsh. Vincent Gallo's parents actually went to the premiere to see this movie. <laughs> I wonder how they really felt about it. And I wonder how close Vince is to his family today. I'm going to say not that close. <laughs> not, not that close. Uh, and the one thing that I, I really want to get into before I talk about the film. Is trying to understand the real Vincent Gallo. He's given interviews. Um, not a lot, but some. And he's sort of has put himself out there and shown the world the way he is and how opinionated he is. But who is he? Is some of his persona an act and then most of it true? Or is a lot of it an act and some of it true? I mean, does he really hate his parents or does he just have a bad taste in his mouth and it helps him artistically? Is Vince one of those guys that is so quirky and weird and different and creepy <laughs> that he sort of just puts it all together in the pot, mixes it up, and that's what you get? But what we do get, folks, because I think he's a tough nut to crack. I do. But what we do get is this film to study, look at, and enjoy. So Buffalo 66, here we go. Let's talk about the movie that, I'm sorry, let's talk about, well, yeah, the movie stars that are in here. And there are movie stars in this. Ben Gazzara, who worked with John Cassavetes. Interesting. Ben worked with Cassavetes a few times. Okay. So when Vince says he doesn't appreciate being compared to John, is that an act? Sort of pushing that away. Oh, I, John Cassavetes, whatever. He did his thing. I do mine. Why did he hire Ben Gazzara then? <laughs> okay. There's also Angelica Houston. That's a movie star. Mickey Rourke. Another movie star. And one of my personal favorite actors. Has a cameo in this movie. Rosanna Arquette is in this as well. Not a big fan of Rosanna Arquette. I think she's... Eh. <laughs> she's not my cup of tea. I mean, she does a fine job. I just don't like her. Sorry. <laughs> and Jan Michael Vincent makes an appearance in this movie and does a phenomenal job. Phenomenal. And he sort of had a sad life. It was really hardcore alcoholic. Died way too soon. And, uh, but I really liked him in this movie. He runs the bowling alley and is really nice to Billy. And you see like a friendship between... Billy Brown's character and Jan Michael Vincent's character in the film. I like it a lot. <clears throat> and of course you have Christina Ricci playing the love interest to Vince's character, Billy. And like I said before, the main character is called Billy Brown. Vince Gallo loves the color brown. 
Brown. <laughs> How many people out there, okay, that you know love the color brown? Not many, if any at all. So right off the bat, you know Vince is sort of a different kind of guy. His favorite color is brown. He uses it a lot in his work artistically. <laughs> and hey, brown it is. And his love interest is Layla, played by Richie. Vince explains in interviews how much he loved watching Christina Ricci act. And just her persona, the way she presents herself on the screen. And couldn't wait to work with her. And we had the opportunity to make this film. He didn't pick her right away. They went with uh, Kristen Dunst. And he was fine with that choice at first. Uh, And when they started to make the picture, Dunst contacted her agent about something. And the agent went to Vince about a problem. Vince doesn't like dealing with agents, by the way. He doesn't have an agent. He doesn't have a publicist. He has nothing. He does everything on his own, which is really rare. Folks, it's so rare that any artist doesn't have representation. And he felt it was a betrayal to have Dunst go through her agent to ask him a question. He said, no, that's not going to happen. Not with me and not with this picture. Dunst, I don't care who you are, how popular you are, how great you are, you're gone. And Vince has also fired other mainstream actresses. In his projects. He has no fear whatsoever. And that's what makes a great artist. By the way in my opinion. The fear factor. If an artist has fear. It's like a cloud covering you. And Vince doesn't have any fear. It's pretty obvious. If you watch him. In interviews. Or anything else. um, His honesty. Comes through pretty well. Although he. I don't consider him extremely cocky. He's just very confident about what he says. Okay. And he trusts himself. He doesn't trust anybody else really. Uh, He will love and like other people and artists. But he will never ever trust them. Never. He trusts number one. Numero uno. And that's Vince. (laughs) Okay. Let's give a brief summary of the plot line. Billy Brown, main character played by Gallo, just gets out of prison. Okay. And he wants to see his parents. Okay. Uh, Parents he hasn't seen in a long time. Five years. And uh, he wants to impress them by showing them that he's married and successful. But there's one problem. He's not married and he's not successful. So he has to kidnap Layla. A tap dancer he sees at a studio and forces her to pretend to be his wife to impress his parents. Okay, that's basically it. And all the things that happen in between sort of explain what's going on with this character, Billy Brown. The first thing you realize is that what is uh, Vincent Gallo trying to say to us in the very beginning of this film? Being in prison. What does that mean? Okay. I think it means the way his childhood in the movie is about his childhood. Although it's not an autobiography look. He says that. It's not an autobiography look at my movie. It's uh, not 100% that. It's close to that. Okay. But this is sort of uh, his take. (laughs) Uh, Putting it into art. Okay. For us to see. And he wanted to sort of go through that in his artistic way about his childhood and how much it affected him. Prison. Being a child in the Gallo household felt like a prison. Okay, that's what I get from that. Something that I really liked about the beginning and uh, goes to show you how good of a writer Gallo is, is he puts in little things here and there. One of the very first things he did was he put in the fact that he had to take a piss in the beginning of the movie when he's let out of prison. He just sort of shows how um, uncomfortable he is 
and how he's not looking forward to seeing his parents. He spends a couple of hours outside the prison, sort of laying on a bench in the freezing cold Buffalo winter. Okay. And he has to take a piss, knocks on the prison doors, and the guard's like, I can't let you in anymore. You can't do it. And you better make the next bus out of town. Because if you don't make the next bus, you know, you're going to be outside all night long in the freezing cold. But Billy's got to take a piss. Stakes are raised now. In the very beginning of the picture, the tension, the, the feeling. We all know what that feeling's like when you have to take a piss. Okay. Okay. It hurts. You can't wait to do it. Okay. Everything is uncomfortable. So Billy makes the bus. You see him on the bus, he looks uncomfortable, he looks like he's in pain, and everything else that's bubbling up inside of him, the anxiety of seeing his parents, having to deal with that. He just got out of prison. He spent five years there for a crime he didn't commit, by the way. So what did he do? Why is he in prison? He's in prison because five years before that, he bet on the Super Bowl. He bet on the Buffalo Bills to win. Uh Uh-oh, Super Bowl 25. Remember that one against the Giants? It came down to a last-second field goal. And Scott Underwood, I believe his name is, missed it. Played out, freaking missed it. Vincent Gallo's character of Billy Brown bet on his home team and lost. Well, how much money did he bet? He bet $10,000. Wow. Guess what? Billy Brown did not have $10,000. So what does that mean? It means he's in a lot of fucking trouble. He's sitting down with the bookie, played by Mickey Rourke. And it was really good. How did Vince get Rourke? Well, Rourke was a little down on his luck at that time in his career. And accepted this role, okay? And I think he did a fine job. Not one of Mick's better performances, but it's okay. It was perfect for the role. He really was. Uh, Gallo knew that. And Gallo loves Mickey Rourke. He met Mickey long before that when he was making the Pope of Greenwich Village with Eric Roberts. Gallo explains he was on his way to play uh, football with his buddies back in the 80s, early 80s. He lived in New York. and He saw um, Eric Roberts and Mickey Rourke really early in the morning, right before shooting, and they were both drunk off their asses and wanted Vince, some kid at that time, passing by to take pictures of them. (laughs) Gallo really treated the encounter very laid back. He knew who Rourke was at the time. He knew who Eric Roberts was, but he didn't make a big deal out of it. And always sort of respected Mickey Rourke. And it, it was a pleasure to have Mickey on this movie. But Mickey Rourke's character, the bookie, explains to Billy Brown... How big of a moron he is. What moron would bet on the Buffalo Bills number one? And what moron would put $10,000, $10,000 you don't have, (laughs) and make a bet like that? He says a lot of bad things can happen to a person like this and their family. But he goes, I have good news. Because the bookie had a friend that was going to be sentenced a crime and if Billy confessed to that crime the debt would be cleared what's Billy going to do he doesn't want to get hurt and he doesn't want his family to get hurt so he accepts it and goes to prison so that's why his character was in prison for five years okay so Billy finally finds a dance studio after he gets off the bus to take a piss. It took him a few places, but he finally finds a bathroom. Once he gets in the bathroom, he's standing next to uh, a a larger young man. And of course, you know, the urinals are pretty close together. And Billy feels very self-conscious about this guy right next to him and says, don't look at me. (laughs) And the guy's looking at him. Billy gets all freaked out, calls him a fag because the guy actually says, oh my God, it's so big. (laughs) So Vince, of course, freaks out and pushes this guy up against the wall, tells him to get out. And because of this encounter, Billy can't piss. 
still can't go to the bathroom. More frustration built into this character. Just He's now just on edge for sure. Runs into Layla, the tap dancer, played by Richie. She's going to the restroom, passes Billy. He asks for 25 cents to make a phone call. He's rude to her. This is where you get to see this edgy, uh, frantic asshole. Um, and he does treat her poorly through 98% of the movie. He does. And I want to explain this. Is this more of a character than the real Vincent Gallo? Yes. Yes. Vincent Gallo is actually a pretty nice guy. Intense. Opinionated. But nice. This character embodies how Vince wanted... Or wanted the opportunity to feel, to experience that, that person, that rudeness, to to act that way to people, to feel that. Uh, It was an acting exercise, an artistic exercise. And he puts it all on Christina Ricci. Poor Christina Ricci making this movie. Folks, I am sure she went through it with Gallo, for sure. And you see in the beginning how rude he is to her. I mean, she gives him the 25 cents. He takes it, doesn't say thank you. She's like, aren't you going to say thank you? He goes, what'd you say? He's being a dick. So Christina Ricci's character, Layla, goes into the bathroom and overhears a Billy talking to his mom on the phone. How uncomfortable it is. And I think she sees um, the vulnerability of Billy through the conversation with his mom. And how he lies. And... How he wants to sort of get off the phone, but he really does want to see his parents because he just has to face that. He knows he has to face it. And there's a kidnapping that takes place right after this. And this sort of bothered me the first time I watched it. And I think even the second time I watched this movie is how believable is that kidnapping. And the first and second time I watched this, I didn't believe that that scene or that moment. And for me, that's a big deal. If I don't truly believe in it in a part in a movie, it bothers me. It's like, I just don't see it happening. I just don't see Billy actually pulling it off and her not making a bigger deal out of this kidnapping. So I'm trying to make sense of it as I watch this film again and again and understand that moment. Because I don't think Vince would put that in there if it didn't make sense to him. He's a better artist than that. That's what I think. I think that I'm just not getting it. So after the fifth time I watched it, I think I got it. And it's the moment that, or moments, that Layla is in the bathroom overhearing the conversation. She actually feels sorry for Billy. And that's important because if she doesn't feel sorry for him, if, you know, there's not that soft spot in her heart before he attempts to kidnap her, then I, I don't think it works. Like He doesn't pull off the kidnapping. You know, she fights harder. She gets away. She runs away. She finds a way because she does have opportunity to get away from him. Um, although it's a very scary moment, she does have chances to run, to get away, but she doesn't. And I guess then the kidnapping makes sense. So Vince finally Gets her in the car, her car, and it's a manual car. It's got a stick shift. This bothers Billy. He tells her, what is this? No, I can't drive these cars. I'm, well, I'd like luxury cars. I love the way Gallo, t- I love the way Gallo, his, his uh, dialogue, uh, it flows beautifully. It, it's real. Um, his words on paper probably look just as good as they do coming out of his mouth and the mouths of all the other actors in this movie. It it goes to show you another comparison with him and Cassavetes. Cassavetes did the same thing with his writing. His dialogue felt improv but it's not. It seems like it, though. Uh, Gallo, I don't think he went to acting school, but it sure seems like he had a technique 
Uh, either he just sort of learned on his own or just through the process of being an actor. But he definitely believes in some sort of technique. And you could see it in the repetitive action of his dialogue. It's, I drive luxury cars. Do you understand that? I don't do manual. Luxury cars. You know, and he repeats th- things often in his dialogue. Because it, it, it really gets there to you. It, it's like nails being dro- driven into your skull. And it, it makes sense. It Boom. And it comes at you and it comes at you again. And you better get it this time. This is what I mean. I'm saying it. Do you get it? You better get it because I'm saying it one more fucking time. And then it really gets in there. And, uh, you know, uh, and then the fact that he doesn't drive manual cars. Okay. (laughs) They have to switch. She has to drive. I like that moment. (laughs) It's a good one. And of course, he continues to berate her. He's got to take a piss. He needs somebody to be with him to visit his parents. And he hopes and prays that he will convince her to come with him. So he tells her to pull over. He's got to finally pee and he does. Thank God he finally pees. And he tells her to put his, her hands on the dash uh, and not look at him. And this is her chance to leave. He's standing You know, 50 feet away, taking a piss out of the car. And she's looking at him. And she could very easily leave. But she doesn't. How believable is that? She's that intrigued with the situation. She stays. What's her deal? As interesting as Billy Brown is, (laughs) Layla may be just as interesting. That character. She stays Interesting. What's the translation? I'll give you mine. (laughs) Because I have one. I think uh, everybody has a bit of narcissism. Some more than others. Vince Gallo, he's a narcissist. How big of a narcissist is he? Well, if I'm translating this part of the movie, why she doesn't leave him, that's Vince Gallo sort of showing What he feels women think of him. Okay. He's a good looking guy. He modeled early in his life. And uh, he's a good looking guy. You know, he's got that sort of rustic sort of uh, European look to him. He's Italian. Uh, He's got the dark hair. You know, he's a good looking guy. Uh, So I think he had a lot of uh, uh, girls uh, telling him how cute he was growing up. Uh, I think he had a way with girls. Uh, Being cute, uh, you know, it helps. So I think he feels that uh, a girl would stick around, okay, (laughs) to see what else is there. Even treating him like garbage, uh, they would stay out of interest and intrigue. I could be wrong on that. What do you think? Okay, now it's time to meet the parents. Billy is obviously, and I mean, it's plain to see in in the film, how nervous he is. They, they get out of the car in front of the house. Little ranch house. And uh, they go very slowly up to the door. And uh, Layla is trying to comfort him. He won't accept it. He tells her, listen, we're going to do this. She's going to do it. She's going to pretend to be his wife. And you have to make me look good, he says. That's your job. This is your big acting break. You know, you're, you're going to make me look good. That's your job. Go along with it. Be nice. Say hi. Say thank you. All that stuff. They're standing at the front door. And Billy sits down. And uh, this is when we have my favorite moment, not only in this film, but (laughs) maybe in almost anything I've ever seen. When he sits down, scared, confused, just going through it, uh, she sits down next to him. And he's like, I don't feel good. I, I feel like I'm going to get sick. You know, uh, uh, you know, he, he's, he's feeling it a lot. And he's so vulnerable. You can see how vulnerable he is. Like Vince is an actor. He allowed himself to be vulnerable, to look vulnerable. And he asked Layla, who's sitting right next to him, can you hold me for a second? And she goes to hold him. And he quickly says, don't touch me. That, 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 that's not only great acting. And it is. It's a, it's a great moment. 
It's great writing. He wanted someone to hold him so bad. But at the thought of somebody actually touching him. And it actually, that touch, he says, don't touch me. There's a lot going on with this guy. Both Vince and Billy Brown. We get to see how much Billy Brown's character and Vince Gallo don't like their dad. Because when they knock on the door and uh, it's answered by the dad, there is no words said between them. Not hello, not come on in, how you been? There's looks, not, the looks aren't even good. Um, what happened between Vince and his dad? I'll give you a story. Vince, now this is coming from Vince. Vince said when he was five years old, him and his siblings, an older brother who was six and a younger sister who was four, were all sitting on the couch in their living room watching TV. The mom was vacuuming their new carpeting. And she noticed, this is the mom, noticed a piece of chocolate on the carpeting underneath the couch. Flips out. Who the fuck got chocolate on my carpet? She asked the brother, Vince's brother. He denies it. The mom asks the daughter. And the daughter denies it, of course. So she automatically assumes it was Vince. Gets the dad. The dad comes down. The dad just rips into Vince. Calling him evil. Call him a little son of a bitch. How could you do that? Vince denies it. It wasn't me. He said, I didn't even eat chocolate. He doesn't like chocolate, he says. I didn't eat chocolate. It wasn't me. The dad was convinced it was Vince. Even drove him to the hospital. The psychiatric part of the hospital. And he threatened Vince. That he would send him to the hospital if he didn't confess. Vince didn't want to back down. He didn't do it. So he didn't want to admit it. Uh, Principal, right? He didn't want to admit that. He said, Dad, I swear to God it wasn't me. Jesus, you know, what's going on here? He's five years old, petrified. His dad is going to throw him into a psych ward. And the dad actually got him out of the car and brought him up to the door and threatened him once again. Tell me the truth. Did you do the chocolate? And Vince got so scared, he admitted it. said, yeah, I did it. All right, fine. And Vince says that at that moment, when Vince confessed, Uh, confessed just to get out of not going into the hospital. He felt his dad actually did believe him at that point that he didn't do it, but there was something wrong in the Gallo household. According to Vince, Uh, the fact that there wasn't enough love, you know, some parents are like that. They just don't give that to their kids. And Vince said that when uh, he turned 16, he was going to leave. And he told his parents that what on his 16th birthday, his dad actually knocked on his bedroom door And said, well, you cocky son of a bitch. Happy birthday. You still leaving? (laughs) You know? And Vince said, yeah, I am. Got his bags and fucking left. He lived with the girlfriend for a few days, he said. And then he left for New York City at the age of 16. Boy, he had to grow up really fast. But in this movie, you get to see what Billy thought of his parents and how they treated him. Now, mind you, this is an artistic um, view of this. So it's not going to be... Like his family life, but just to peek at it artistically through Vincent Gallo's eyes. Simply, his parents treat him like a second class citizen. They ignore him, they forget the things he likes, the things he's allergic to. Um, everything else seems more important. The Buffalo Bills are more important to the mom than to her son. The dad pretty much completely ignores Billy until he sees Billy's knife at the kitchen table while they're eating pointed towards the dad and blames Billy that you shouldn't have the knife pointed towards me and they fight about it and they show that the dad also hurt uh, Billy's dog when he was little and I mean how much of that could be true about something that happened in Vince's childhood where the dad hurt uh, a pet or maybe something that Billy loved or Vince loved in his childhood. And uh, Vincent Gallo, the person says that he would hide away in his basement a lot and play with toys in his basement to be away from the family. So it goes to show you that he really was disconnected with his family. Uh, One of the things I want to point out here is the outfit or the, the dress that Christina Ricci is playing as Layla. Um, It seems to me, That everything had to be approved by Gallo in this movie. And because he directed it. 
And I'm sure he picked out Christina Ricci's outfit. And uh, wow, really get to see a good part of her uh, <laughs> cleavage here and h- how sexy she is. I'm, I'm assuming Vincent Gallo had a thing for Ricci. I don't know if anything did happen there, but uh, it goes to show you um, that he wanted to sort of show off Christina Ricci to us. Am I right? I mean, he does. Uh, why? I wonder. Is that just the character, you know? Uh, and am I wrong? Was Christina Ricci picking out her outfit? I don't think so. For the research I did on Gallo, no fucking way. Uh, A good uh, story about this, and I love doing tidbits more than the plot line, stuff like that. So in this episode, I I may not touch on everything in the plot or in the movie and point out everything. I'd rather talk about interesting things that happen on set before the movie was made. Kevin Corrigan plays Goon. In this movie. And in my opinion. It's the best performance in the movie. Besides Gallo. I like Ricci too. But Corrigan. Who plays Goon. And or Rocky. (laughs) If you watch the movie. And I hope you do. uh, Goon tells Billy. (laughs) Throughout the movie at one point. That he changed his name from Goon. To Rocky. And Vince is a big Sly Stallone fan. And loves Rocky. Um, so he put that in there, but Kevin Corrigan explained how intense, uh, Vince is on the set. And just as a person, Kevin Corrigan met Vince Gallo years before this movie was made, uh, visiting their mutual friend at a hospital. He met Vince for the first time there and remembers how, um, colorful Vince was and remembers this hospital visit. Uh, Vince telling these wonderful stories. He just seems to be that sort of engaging personality. And through time, Gallo is just a film buff. He watches everything. You know, uh, I think Vincent Gallo is definitely uh, well versed in all sorts of film, and was impressed with Kevin Corrigan and something he saw. Called up Kevin and said, "I want you to play my brother in a project I'm doing." And Kevin said, absolutely. You know, <laughs> it's great. I'll play your brother. Sure. And so every time Vince would run into Kevin or talk to him about the project, he made it pretty clear they were going to be brothers in this movie. And oh my God, he Vince would go up to people that they knew and be like, you know, Kevin and I, you know, we look alike, right? He could be my brother. And, and Kevin said when he was given the script eventually... He wasn't going to play his brother anymore and was really confused. (laughs) Either Vince was convincing him to do this through lies just to get him to do the movie. (laughs) Or Vince completely changed the script at the last minute. Who knows? But Vince wanted Kevin to play Goon. And when Kevin said yes, Vince was very happy. When Kevin read the script, Kevin was not very happy. He told Vince, I'm out. I'm not playing this character. This character's pathetic. I'm going to be under your thumb. I kind of have an idea of you and how you work. And I'm not, no, I don't want this. And uh, Vince, unhappy about that, what's he going to do? He's like, fine, all right, don't do it. I'll get somebody else. And he did. Um, And Kevin explained that he was up for an award. This is Kevin. Kevin was up for an award, lost. That night got drunk because he was so depressed. And he sort of reached out to Gallo in desperation just to make himself feel better. Called Gallo and said, I'll do the picture. Now, he did it out of depression. (laughs) And uh, Vince said, great. He goes, there's nobody else that can play Goon. You're the only one that can do it. And Kevin... Felt he made a mistake by going back to Vince. And I think that Kevin regrets it. Uh, I think he regrets being in the movie. He regrets giving in to it to just make himself feel better. Boost his confidence as an actor. Maybe just taking on something he really didn't want to do. And I kind of respect that. Um, as an actor, I would uh, be drawn to stuff that scared me a little bit and was a challenge. That's just me. I would have 
loved to do a character like Goon, that would have been right up my alley. That's something I would have wanted to do. I'm submissive in that way in my art. So I probably would have done very well with Gallo giving me direction and sort of putting me through that. Because Kevin explains that that's exactly what Gallo did. Uh, Gallo was big on getting Kevin prepared for his scenes with him. Uh, doing a lot of uh, work off the set. Uh, getting comfortable with one another. Uh, Vincent knows what he's doing. He's an artist through and through. Uh, if you ever do research on Vince, he came up in the 80s, uh, was really into the art scene. He was actually a very successful artist in New York City in the 80s, selling his art and quit. In uh, I think in 1990, he completely quit art at the peak of his career out of spite. He said he just didn't want to do it anymore. And if he does art, he does it for his own worth, uh, not selling it unless he needs to. <laughs> and, uh, and sometimes he does. Uh, but I think as far as his uh, painting, if he does paint anymore, he does it on his own time. And then he just sort of lets it be. So I, I want to sort of leave the parents' house, uh, the talk with the parents uh billy and layla they go through this uncomfortable situation and you could tell that the the billy and his parents are very disconnected there's just there's no chemistry there it's 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 mean it's cruel it's uncomfortable it's just not right and layla tries to soften the, the blow you know the, of this this thing going on with uh, giving false stories about billy and how successful he is how how beautiful he is as a husband and how lucky she is to have him. And of course the parents aren't buying it. They know, I'm sure they know Billy from his past and he was probably a bullshitter. And I'm sure Vince is as well. And they don't believe her and they leave the house. Don't want to talk any more about uh, the uh, parent situation. It is what it is. Watch the movie. You get what you get out of it. If you want to leave comments in the comment section about something I missed, that's fine. Because I did. I, I don't want to go through everything. I want to get on to him leaving the house, being upset with Layla about telling the stories, being too outlandish. And he goes and takes out his frustration by going bowling. Yes, that's right. Love it. I love bowling too. And you know Vince, as a kid, bowled. He grew up in Buffalo. I grew up in Cleveland. Not much of a difference there. <laughs> we bowl in the wintertime. And uh, he made it pretty clear that he likes to bowl. You see him bowl. He does a really good job bowling. And I like as an artist, Vince picking things, he knows. Okay. He, he's not a faker in that way with his art. Uh, they always say the, the greatest teachers or people who n know what they're doing in art, always do what you know when you write. Okay, don't write about stuff you don't know. It'll come through how fake you are. If you really know something and you want to embellish it artistically, that's fine. But it better be rooted in truth, your truth. So you, this is something that uh, touches me when I watch something like Buffalo 66 and loving it so much is because you could tell like there's deep rooted truth in this movie. And it comes through. That's what I like. I like movies like this. I liked watching him bowl. I liked his interaction with Jan Michael Vincent in that scene. It was, it felt real. Look at Jan Michael Vincent in this scene. Look at his face. The way he treats Billy. There must, I'm thinking, and I don't know if this is true. I think Vince and Jan Spent some quality time together. I don't know what they did. Maybe they went away for a weekend in a cabin, got drunk, told stories. Uh, you know, like maybe Vince got some stuff out of him, some personal things. Because uh, Jan had a lot of stuff going on, for sure. Okay, a lot of demons. And boy, you could tell in that scene. Something happened between Vince and Jan. There is no doubt about it. And it's a small scene. They have a few moments together. But what happened there? 
you see like this look on Jan's face of of like love for Vince. It's really weird, but cool. What did Vince do to Jan? <laughs> what is like what does he do? What did he do? He did something. Works. It's it's gold. It's it's uh acting gold, movie gold, moment to moment gold, but it's gold. Uh, there's a tap dancing scene with Christina Ricci's character, Layla, where she uh, gives a little dance. And this was all choreographed by Ricci. And you could tell there's a moment where she messes up a little bit, gives a smile. But uh, it looks like Gallo liked that moment. Kept it. I like that. I like that. Uh, it didn't have to be visually perfect. Another comparison to Cassavetes. Cassavetes would have loved that. That little moment. And Ricci kept going. She didn't stop. You know, she choreographed that routine. Uh, she messed up a, just a little. She gave a little smile. But she kept going. Once again, I like that. Not everything's going to be perfect, perfect. Okay? And it's little sweet moments like that. Make a picture like this. Work. I want to mention the photo booth scene in the bowling alley. They take a break uh, to take some pictures. And it's a very important part in the movie. Uh, they go into one of those little booths where you take three pictures. And, uh, you know, like a, a couple would do. Or you're just goofing around. Uh, Richie's character, Layla, goofs around with the first set. He doesn't like it. He goes, we're spanning time. And the first couple of times I watched this, I always thought he said, we're spending time. That's not what he says. He says we're spanning time, which means we're going through the motions in time. We're, we're, we're a couple. We love each other very much. We're spanning time. And through our longevity of this relationship, I want it all to come together in this little photo booth and make it work. And she does the best she can to please him. That's all she wants to do. And it comes through in the photo booth scene. The fact that she wants to please him. But can he be pleased? <laughs> Does it seem like he could be pleased? That character up to that point? You have doubts. So after they bowl, they go to Denny's to have something to eat. And they run into uh, a, a girl that Billy had a crush on. Since kindergarten. He even had this girl's picture. In his locker in the bowling alley. An obsession. A girl that you always had a crush on. Dreamt about it. And it just didn't happen. Well she walks into Denny's. This girl. Played by Rosanna Arquette. Her name's Wendy. And she recognizes Billy. They have an awkward little moment there. And Layla realizes that this is the girl that he wants her to be, ultimately. But she's not this Wendy. Layla is a Layla. And as intriguing as Billy is, she's now questioning if she can ever have a future with him. And how? And you're thinking to yourself up to this point, how could Layla be interested in Billy at all? She sees something, obviously. And Vince as an actor does give you moments, not many, of the vulnerability of Billy. And Layla sees all those cute little moments, hanging on to those little moments. But she's frustrated at this point because Billy isn't opening up to her. She asks him, was this the girl that you liked? And I want you to talk about it with me. She wants to get something out of him. She just can't do it right now. And he tells her that. I can't do this. I can't talk about this. So he tells her, let's get the hell out of here. We just, just go. And she doesn't want to leave. She's, I'm not leaving. We came here. She wants a hot chocolate. And she wants to stay. She wants to talk about this. Vince and his character, Billy, get up and leave. He's frustrated. Uh, he has to go to the bathroom again. <laughs> Always get, this guy must have a really weak bladder. You know, he likes to put that in there. Maybe that's uh, his way of sort of flushing out stuff in his character. Uh, to pee, the cleanse, 
You know, he runs into really difficult situations that he really can't handle, so he has to pee. So he realizes that uh, he may have overreacted, goes back to Denny's, apologizes, (laughs) and he opens up a little bit. Not much, but a little bit. They go to a motel, get a room, sit down. He wants to take a bath. She wants to join him. He says no. She pleads with him. He says no. I'm bathing. Yeah, I love, I love like I get, I'm going to say again, I love the way he talks because I'm bathing. I, I don't want anybody in here when I bathe. I'm bathing. I told you that. I'm bathing. <laughs> but she convinces him. And eventually there's a scene. They're both sitting in the tub. And he's like, don't touch me. <laughs> you know, I got, you're in the tub. You don't have to touch me. I'm, I'm taking a bath. <laughs> and, uh, it, you know, you can tell that she's getting closer and closer to him. He pushes and she pushes more. He gives in. Like It's not like this stone wall with him. I like that. Okay. He puts it up like it's a stone wall, but she's chipping away at him. And before I go any further, I want to mention the scene between Kevin Corrigan, goon, <laughs> good old goon, and Billy when he goes on his flashbacks every now and then, I'm not touching on all the flashbacks, but one of the most priceless flashbacks is when he's ready to go to prison and he's explaining to Goon that he has um, envelopes filled with birthday cards, Christmas cards, and things like that. He doesn't want his parents to know he's going to prison. He's going to have Goon send out all these envelopes every year until he gets out, and that's his job. And the way he explains this to Goon, you know, like, okay, January, this is my birthday to my mom. You send it anytime in January. I think it was June. Anytime in June. You see June? You send out the envelope. Did you get that? Did you? He's treating him like a child. And Goon is like a child. And Kevin is great at portraying that. More great moments as an actor and acting. You can tell Vince he works his actors hard. He's a director's actor. He's an actor. So director's actors are the best, although they might be the hardest on you because they know what it takes to get a good performance. If they're doing it right. And he did it right with Kevin too. Look at how good Kevin is in that scene. He's putting his hands up to his face. He looks so vulnerable. He's trying to hide his face. <laughs> it's like, ah, gah, gah, gah. Uh, Vince seemed to open up, uh, just rip his skin off. It's good stuff. I love talking about... This is why... I haven't done this podcast in a while. I haven't been motivated. It's not easy to come on and and just take an hour or two to record. I got a lot of stuff going on. My personal life. Just going through stuff. And uh, I watched Buffalo 66 on Tuesday. I haven't seen it in a while. So it was there and I said, fuck yeah. And I got a little artistic boost. Uh, you know, I've been lacking with that lately. I've just, it's been hard for me to just get into stuff that's going on today. The, the artistic greatness seems to be grounded in yesteryear for me. But that's just me. There may be great stuff out right now. Guess what? I don't see it. I don't see it. I got to go. The Buffalo 66 made in 1998 to get something out of me. And Vincent Gallo, as much as you may not like Vincent Gallo, he's an artist and a pretty damn good one too. This movie proves it. And that's why I'm talking about it today. Get a little, when I go there, get stern, direct, to the point. And I want to say that it's movies like this that are important, I think. More so than stuff blowing up. I get it's entertainment. And so is this. Um, but it's like I watched uh, John Wick. I liked it. But I didn't love it. It's entertainment. Yeah, it's great. But Buffalo 66 is, is gritty. It's a movie. It's, it feels real. That's the stuff I like. Isn't that what it's supposed to really be? For, and for me, that's that's the way it is for me. And maybe it's for you too. And if not, 
I just hope you enjoy this episode. I've been done in a while. <laughs> Hello out there. Uh, the five of you who are probably still listening right now. Hi. I hope you're doing well. How are you doing? Okay, so let's get back to the bathtub. The, okay? <laughs> they're in the bathtub. And then they're out of the bathtub. And finally, Billy sort of breaks down and starts talking deep conversation with Layla. He tells her about Wendy, the crush he had, how it affected him. And it did. And Layla finally breaks through to Billy. They lay in the bed. And they, and oh God, some great moments, man. I mean, oh, oh, it's so good. Vince has the camera. Bird's eye view. And you, you see him go as far away from her on the bed as possible. And then she goes for his hand. And he holds it for a second and then pulls it away. And then he kind of gets close to her. And she, you know, and she wants to get close to him. And, and, and then he sort of rejects it. And then finally, another moment where he kind of he goes into her in more like a motherly way of more. I know, just hold me. I'm finally letting you kind of hold me. He goes into her chest. Nothing sexual. Just hold me. I love Vincent Gallo, by the way. They fall asleep. He's comfortable enough with her. They fall asleep. But he wakes up in the middle of the night. Because guess what? He's got a job to do. And I didn't mention this at all yet. But he did it for a reason. It all comes to this point. Because all the stuff going on with him. um, His parents. Okay. um, Dealing with, you know, personal relationships. Although he didn't have many. I mean, his best friend is sort of semi-retarded. Goon. And no girlfriend. And he just spent five years in prison. But there's one thing that he has to do. And that is to kill (laughs) that fucking field goal kicker of the Buffalo Bills that missed that field goal. And Billy believes that, that the kicker missed it on purpose. Because when he was in prison, he was told by another inmate that this kicker was paid off. And he screwed Billy Out of not only money, but time. Five years in prison. And he told Goon, I'm going to kill that son of a bitch. (laughs) That fucker. That fucker. I'm going to kill that fucker. And he found out where he was. And he was going to do it. He was going to go out and he was going to kill this son of a bitch. I'm going to do it. And he gets up to go at like 2 o'clock in the morning. Layla wakes up. Where are you going? He goes, I'll be I'm getting some coffee. I'll be right back. She's like, can you get me a... A hot chocolate. He says, yes, I I, I will. And she says, Billy, are you going to come back? I love it. Love it. More great writing. (laughs) And she just comes right out and says it. Instead of just thinking it, like, you know, thinking, God, I hope he comes back. Because she has fallen for him. But has he fallen for her? And he says, yeah, I'll be like five minutes. She knows it's not going to be five minutes. There's something else going on. (laughs) And... They hug, sort of. He rejects the hug at first, but they hug. And he goes out to do his thing. To find Scott Wood. The kicker. The fucker. And he finds him. At a, uh, I guess this kicker, Scott Wood, owns a titty bar. And we see some tits in the bar. He confronts the kicker. Turned titty club owner. And presents a gun. Shoots him in the head. And then Billy commits suicide. The directing in that scene, brilliant, different, artistic, in an independent way, right? The still shots, the artistry. But it's all just a thought, a revelation. Billy did walk into that titty bar. Billy did walk up to Scott Wood, that motherfucker missing that field goal. But he didn't present the gun. 
It was just a glimpse of what it would be if Billy actually did what he wanted to do in that moment. But he doesn't. In that moment, he realizes there's more to life than revenge. There's a girl sitting in a motel room crazy about him. What is he thinking? He'll finally have someone. He won't be alone. And then you get Happy Billy. He walks into a donut shop. Gets some donuts. (laughs) Gets a, a hot chocolate for Layla. And he's chipper. And he's happy. Buffalo 66. 1998. Vincent Gallo. Christina Ricci. Mickey Rourke. Ben Gazzara. Angelica Houston. Jan Michael Vincent. One of my favorite independent movies. One of my favorite movies, period. Before I go. Wrapping this up. I gotta talk a little bit more about Vince and how interesting he is. <laughs> he has a website, okay? Ladies and gentlemen, listening to the actors' room, I implore you to treat yourself to VincentGallo.com. Is that what it is? I think it is. I think it's just simply VincentGallo.com. Oh, there it's a treat, folks. I, I was laughing my ass off going through his website. Just a few things on his site that are noteworthy. He's Vincent Gallo is available in in evenings and weekends as an escort. <clears throat> For the low, low price of fifty grand, all your wishes, dreams, and fantasies come true. Ladies only. (laughs) Folks, I could go in to all of that, but you got to read it. He's so good. He is so funny. This is what I'm talking about with him. Is this real? Like, if somebody called him, bit on this, and said, I have 50 grand, treat me. Make all my dreams come true. You, for an evening, you can have Vincent Gallo for 50 grand, I guess. He also can give you his sperm for donation. And I forget. Did I have write that in there? I forget how much that is. It's around there. It might be 100 grand. He can donate his sperm for, uh, you know, insemination. And uh, <laughs> there's a whole section on that, too. And there's all sorts of rules and guidelines and things. And, and like I said, I can't, there's certain things I just, I can't say on my podcast. I, don't, I just can't do it. That's how weird and interesting he is. And he's creepy. He calls other creepy people creepy. <laughs> For instance, I'm going to give you a quote by Vincent Gallo here. Uh, as soon as I find it here, just a second. Here it is. Quote, I don't trust or love anyone. Because people are so creepy. Creepy, creepy creeps. Creeping around, creeping here, and creeping there. Creeping everywhere. Creepity, crappity creepies. End of quote. Uh, Vince, you're creepy. (laughs) He's made it known he was uh, arrested for flashing when he was a kid. People that flash, what flashing is, you show your junk. He got in trouble for that. So yeah, he's a bit of a creep. <laughs> okay. He's admitted it. This is not a rumor. Like, he's creepy. It, it, as much as I admire his uh, artistic goals, he says he doesn't have goals. I think he's full of shit. Uh, he's got goals. And there's a certain way he does things. It's weird. But interesting. Look him up yourself. You won't be disappointed. <laughs> I guarantee it. Got some crazy views, but he makes for great art. He's an actor. He's a painter. He's a writer. 
director. He's a musician. He did. Uh, he's been in dozens of bands since he was a kid. He plays guitar. Uh, notably, he had a band with uh, Lucas Haas. I know Lucas a little bit. He's a really cool guy. We used to play Trivia Crack. <laughs> Hope you're doing well, Lucas. I haven't talked to him in a long time. But Vincent and Lucas had a band. And they had a song, a very sweet song. I like it. And I'm going to play it at the very end of this episode. To show just how talented Vincent is. I think you'll like the song. Hopefully you'll give a listen to it. I'm going to post it at the very end. Thank you. Once again, for listening to the Actors Room, I'm Jeff. Hope all is well. I'm doing okay. And you know what? Getting through it. I'm going through it. I'm getting through it. And I will go through it. I'm 46. You know, <laughs> I started this podcast about six years ago. Yeah, I haven't done anything in six months. And I'd like to get back to it. And hopefully, I could do more. We'll see. Uh, Before I go, thank you, Vince, for giving me Buffalo 66. I may talk about the Brown Bunny. The other movie he did. Holy shit. God bless you, everyone. Have a good one. And here is Vincent Gallo with Lucas Haas. They called the band Bunny. And this is one of their songs. I hope you enjoy. Have a good one. I'm Vincent Gallo. It's Lucas Haas. We're the band Bunny. And this next song is called How Long. Is that okay? Okay. 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 Um.